Welcome to Calvary. My name is Sean and I am the online gathering pastor. Wherever you are listening in from today, you are welcome. At Calvary Church, we are excited to be on mission to catalyze an epic release of Jesus apprentices who are connecting to Christ, to community, and their calling. And if you live in the central PA region, here are just a couple of things we would love for you to get involved with. You know, as Jesus apprentices, we are created to worship and we are called to pray. So let me ask you, are you hungry for the presence of God? Well, if so, we encourage you to attend the 36 hours of prayer and worship coming up on Saturday, August 26th and Sunday the 27th, held at the State Theater in downtown State College. This prayer event will be led by several Central PA congregations. We will worship and we will pray for a move of God throughout Central PA, especially within the next generation. You know, that's also a CWOW weekend, which stands for Church Without Walls. So we encourage you to go as the church that weekend to be the church wherever you are. It's also a great weekend to invite some friends or neighbors over for a treat like ice cream sundaes. And one last area that you can serve is with our food pack, which is coming up the last weekend of September. We are aiming for over 1,000 volunteers across our region with plans of packing 240,000 meals and 30,000 seed packets that are gonna be sent to those in need in the Middle East. It's a great but easy opportunity to invite friends, neighbors, or coworkers. Registration is now open, so for more information, go to the link at the bottom of your screen. And you know, if you don't live in the central PA region, you can still be part of all of these opportunities. You can pray for a move of God wherever you are at. You can schedule to invite some of your neighbors or friends over for some ice cream sundaes. Or you can give financially to support the seed pack. It takes a lot of resources to do this, and we would love for you to be involved. And speaking of support, we also want to give you an opportunity to practice generosity. And all throughout Scripture, we find that we are instructed to be people of generosity with our lives, with our time, and of course, with our finances. So we want to encourage you to let your giving be part of your worship today. The easiest way to give is through the Calvary app. And I just want to say thank you so much for being part of all that God is doing through His church. Well, coming up shortly, Pastor Dan will be sharing with us how as Jesus apprentices, we are each called to prayer. But before that, let's spend some time worshiping together and singing about the importance of our dependence on God in our lives. Thanks for joining us. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily. This is the air I breathe. 
Hey, welcome to Calvary. However you found us, wherever you find yourself, physically, emotionally, or even spiritually, you are so welcome. You know, for the last few months, I've been diving into the Psalms personally and in my More Than Bread podcast. More Than Bread is, I don't know, I guess it's a 20-minute dive into Scripture because we need more than bread to thrive. We need every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's on Spotify, iTunes, Google, wherever you get your podcasts. A- anyway, this, this chapter of the podcast uh, I've called Top 40 Psalms. It's my favorite 40 out of 150, and most of them were written by this guy named David. Uh, you probably know David, right? Shepherd, giant killer, king, sinner, worshiper of God, that David. And if you don't know David, let, let me give you just a little bit of context. He, he started life in a blue-collar family, hard-working family in a hard time. National recession, political upheaval, war. As the youngest of eight, he knew what it was like to be overlooked. Last in line, last in rank. Like most of us, he experienced the highs and lows of life. And early in his life, he, he experienced incredible success. He gained national attention. He became a, a war hero of sorts. And in the process, he gained the ill will of the nation's top leader. He went from giant killer to de- cave dweller. One minute he was on top of the world and the next he was in the bowels of the earth. He, he had a best friend and he lost a best friend. He experienced the bliss of marriage and the pain of separation. He knew what it was like to have the masses cheer him and, and he knew what it was like to fail as a husband and a father. He became the greatest leader his country has ever known. He inspired the most incredible loyalty and passion in the hearts of those around him, and yet 
He never saw the completion of the driving vision of his heart. He was a deeply spiritual man, a songwriter, a worshiper with a a heart that hungered for God. And, And if you had known him, I'm convinced you would have said he was a guy connected, connected with God. He was deeply spiritual, and yet he also experienced times of deep spiritual darkness. But, but you know, in the midst of it all, here's what I love. In the midst of it all, he persevered. David endured through some of the most difficult circumstances we could ever imagine, through some of the greatest failures we could ever hope to miss, through broken times of conviction so deep he covered himself in ashes, through, through spiritual times so dark he travailed in prayer. But somehow he found the heart to go on, and, and he was not the only one. You know what? Down through the ages, people have found the heart to go on, even in the midst of some of the driest, hardest, most life-draining times. And, and how did they do it? I, I, think, I think it's because they kept going hard after God. They were all in, wholehearted, soul-thirsty seekers of God, hungry for his presence and unwilling to settle for anything less. I think in some ways that's why I was drawn to Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 2 this week, just as a, a beginning to our message, because I, I love this picture that, that these verses give us of the life of faith. The, the writer of Hebrews gives us this charge in, in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It's all about the life of faith, and here's what he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this, Hebrews writes, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Oh man, those those words just, they, they drip with inspiration and challenge. I mean, imagine this, we're surrounded by this Huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, to the right, to the left, in front of us, behind us, all yelling for us to keep going hard after God. Don't give up and encouraging us to endure, cheering us on as we surrender to God and and kneel at times in desperate, hopeful prayer, singing at the top of their lungs as we lift our hearts to join them in worship. There are people who have been there, who who know the path, Not, not just fans in the stands, players who have run the race before us. I've had moments when, when my picture of this crowd has, has deepened and, and shifted and formed. For example, when I, when I read through the history of Calvary, our church, and, and I get a sense, a sense of the people whom God has touched and used for the last almost seven decades at Calvary. When Lynn and I visited Israel, my sense of that crowd grew even more. In Israel, if something is less than 500 years old, it's not even a tourist attraction. And and as I walked in these places where other witnesses to the life of faith had walked, I I realized this crowd goes back thousands of years. The Psalms are a collection of 150 prayers and songs of worship. Prayers and songs that started in the heart of an individual witness to the life of faith, a moment where someone like you or me cried out to God. But you know, since that moment, these prayers have been prayed, these songs have been sung by millions of God followers for thousands of years. Whenever we read the Psalms, whenever we pray or sing them, it's like we're standing alongside this huge crowd. The words we speak have been spoken millions of times in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Spanish, Norwegian, Chinese, Malay, Estonian, Spanish, and Burmese. I mean, just imagine it. As you pray the Psalms, Off to your right stand Moses and Miriam, and in front of you David and Solomon kneel down in prayer. To your left are Jesus and Paul, Mary, John, Peter. Behind you come the voices of Augustine and Teresa of Avila, Luther, Amy Carmichael, D.L. Moody, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, Reese Howell, your, your grandmother or your grandfather, and Mabel. I love to imagine Mabel cheering me on. In his book, Trying to Be Good, Tom Schmidt relates the story of Mabel, the state-run convalescent hospital, the nursing home in his area is a difficult place to visit. It's understaffed and filled with hopeless people cut off from, cut off from vital life, good life, the good life. They're lonely, just, some of them just waiting to die. And even on the brightest of days, Tom would say the, the light would just seem to wait at the door and the smells of sickness and, and stale urine would permeate the halls. 
For four years as a volunteer, he visited once or twice a week, and, and he always left with a sense of relief. But one day, he was walking in an unfamiliar hallway, looking with very little success for someone who seemed alive enough to receive a flower and a few words of encouragement. I don't know, maybe you've been in a place like this. Sometimes it seems like the hallways contain the worst cases, strapped into wheelchairs, completely helpless. As he neared the end of this hallway, he saw an old woman strapped up in a wheelchair, and, and honestly, her face was, was kind of repulsive. The white pupils of her eyes and, and the empty stare told him that she was blind. A, a large hearing aid told him she was at least partially deaf. Well, one side of her face was being eaten by cancer, and there was a discolored and running sore covering part of one cheek. And, and it had pushed her nose to a side and dropped an eye and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was now the bottom. And as a result, she drooled constantly. He later discovered that when new nurses arrived, the supervisors would send them to feed this woman because if they could stand this sight, they could handle anything in the building. 89 years old, bedridden, blind, nearly deaf, and and she had been all alone for about 25 years. Her, her name was Mabel. As Tom remembers his first encounter with Mabel, he writes, I, I don't know why I even spoke to her. She seemed unlikely to respond, but, but I put a flower in her hand and I said, Happy Mother's Day. She held the flower to her face and tried to smell it, and then she spoke. And to my surprise, he said, her, her words, though garbled because of her deformity, were, were obviously produced by a clear mind. She said, Thank you. It's lovely. But can I give it to someone else? I, I can't see it, you know. I'm blind. And Tom said, of course. And, and he began to push her chair down the hallway to a place where he thought they might find some alert patients. And, and they found one. And Mabel held out the flower and said, this is from Jesus. Now, seeing that incredible act of grace, it just kind of began to dawn on Tom that Mabel was perhaps an uncommon person. He wheeled her back to a room and began to learn more about Mabel. She'd grown up on a small farm that she managed with only her mother until she died, and then, and then she ran the farm alone until her blindness and sickness sent her to the nursing home, to the convalescent hospital. For 25 years, she got weaker and sicker with constant headaches and backaches and stomach aches, and then they discovered the cancer. Her, she had roommates. Her three roommates screamed occasionally but never talked. They often soiled their bedding, and because the place was understaffed, the smell was was often overpowering. So as you imagine that, let me just ask you, as you ponder Mabel, <laughs> we, we talk about the good life quite a bit in our culture, but what is the good life? Would, would you characterize any element of Mabel's life at that moment, any element whatsoever as being a definitive part of the good life? Mabel and Tom became friends, and he visited her once or twice a week for the next three years. Some days, he'd read to her from the Bible, and, and often when he'd stop, she'd continue reciting that passage from memory, word for word. Sometimes he'd take a book of hymns and sing with her. She knew all the words of the old songs, but for Mabel, these were not merely exercises in memory. She'd often stop mid-hymn and make a comment about lyrics that she considered particularly relevant to her own situation. Reflecting back, Tom wrote, you know, it was not many weeks before I turned from this sense that I was being helpful to a sense of wonder, and I began to go to her with a pen and paper to write down the things that she would say. During a hectic week of final exams, frustrated because his mind just seemed to be pulled in, in 10 directions all at once, a thought came to him, I, I wonder what Mabel I wonder what Mabel has to think about hour after hour, day after day. And so he went to her and asked, Mabel, what do you think about when you lie here? And she said, I think about my Jesus. Now, do you understand? This is the race set before us. What is the race set before us? Jesus is the race set before us. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, not just because he's our inspiration, but because he is our destination. He's not just our guide and our model. He's our prize. It's a race for more God. When Mabel said, I think about Jesus, Tom sat there and he thought for a moment about the difficulty for him of thinking about Jesus for even five minutes. And, and he asked her, what do you think about Jesus? She replied slowly and deliberately. She said, well, I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life. You know, I'm, I'm one of those kind who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. 
He's all the world to me. See, I think there was a time in David's life where that was how he felt. This writer of Psalms, this warrior poet king with a huge appetite for life, this this passionate worshiper of God, there was a time in his life where he had lost everything that we would say was necessary for the good life. He was living in caves on the run from a king who wanted to kill him, lost his family, lost his home, lost his reputation, lost his freedom, and, and it was during those days that he created, he would create this song of worship found in Psalm 63. A psalm of David written, it says, while he was in the desert, the wilderness of Judea. So listen to his words in Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. It says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints. It longs for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love, your unfailing love is better than life, my lips will praise you. And so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. See, it's kind of like when David had nothing, he knew that God was his everything. God was his life. And and this is worship. It's more than a song. It's even more than a prayer. It's a soul thirsty for God, a, a dull ache that arises when we miss him. It happens when we gaze upon his glory and then at the same time realize that his unfailing love is better than life itself. That's worship, this connection between love and glory. You know, David had the fingerprints of God's glory all over his heart. He had gazed upon God's power and his glory and he found that God's unfailing love was better than life itself. That's worship. And listen to me. We are created to worship. We're created to worship. We all worship. If we don't worship God, something else will slip into our hearts because we were created to worship. Our our ultimate desires ultimately shape our worship. See, we seek what we think will satisfy our hearts. That's worship. And if he is my God, I will earnestly seek him because my soul thirsts for him. Ken Blanchard shares a story of Shia. Um, She was four years old when her baby brother was born. And almost immediately, she began asking her mom and dad to leave her alone with a new baby. They they were kind of worried that maybe she was jealous and they weren't sure what she would do if they left her alone. So they just said no. And, but over time, since Shia was mostly loving to her brother and, and she kept asking, they decided to let Shia have her private moment, her conference with the baby. Elated, Shia went into the baby's room, shut the door, but it opened just a crack, just enough for mom and dad to peek in and listen. And they saw little Shia walk quietly up to her baby brother, put her face close to his, and they heard her say, baby, tell me what God looks like. I'm starting to forget. Her soul was thirsty for God. Julianne Barnes, award-winning author of of Nothing to Be Afraid of, describes himself as as an agnostic. He, He writes, I was never baptized, never sent to Sunday school. I've never been to a normal church service in my life. And yet this agnostic intellectual still feels, in his words, haunted by the beauty of Christian art and music and by what he calls the wake up call to morality. In fact, the opening line of his book is, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. That's because we're, we're created to worship. Uh, Augustine said our, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. Theologian Karl Barth called it our incurable God sickness. We were created to worship. We're, we're thirsty for God. And, and, and David, you understand, David is not just talking about being slightly thirsty. He, he's basically saying, if I don't get God, I'm going to die. David was God captivated, his soul longed for God. In in the 1940s, A.W. Tozier was traveling by train from Chicago to Texas, and he started writing. He wrote through the night, and by the time he arrived, he had the rough draft of the description of a God-captivated heart, the pursuit of God. I, I love that book. Every time I read it, God grabs my heart again with words like, in this hour of all but universal darkness, one cheering gleam appears. 
He writes, within the fold of conservative Christianity, there are to be found increasing numbers of people whose religious lives are marked by a growing hunger after God himself. They're eager for spiritual realities and will not be put off with words. They are, he wrote, a thirst for God. Let me just pause for a moment and ask those of us who believe that we are thirsty for God. Are we really thirsty for God? Or are we thirsty for the gifts of God? I don't know about you, but that's where I have to keep poking my heart because sometimes the, the greatest destroyer, the greatest block of worship is, is not the enemies of God, it's his gifts, it's the gifts of God. We, we begin to believe that his gifts are what will satisfy our souls. Are you a thirst for God and God alone? See, David cries out because God is the great desire of his heart. David hungers and he thirsts for God. He, he prays in verses five through eight, God, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. See, David is, is hungry for God. He's spiritually parched. Life is going to hell around him, but he has faith in God, so he's, he's clinging to God, clinging to God. You know, as they grew up, each of my kids and now my grandkids have gone through a phase where, where they have this love-fear relationship with pools. They love to be in the water, but are deathly afraid of going under the water. And so they cling. My, my granddaughter, Maisie, most recently, I mean, you want the world's best hug. Get her in the pool. Her little arms will go around your neck and squeeze so tight that you can hardly breathe. She's clinging like David clung to God. But, but when you picture that, could, could she cling if there was anything between us? No. Her arms aren't long enough. You, you can't cling well if there's something between you and the one to whom you cling. And, and this isn't just kids. You know, I like to think that I'm fairly capable, a high achiever who can do much well. But I, I've always known that the dreams and the vision that God has put on my heart were bigger than me. But here's where I too often mess up. Somewhere along the way, I begin to think that even though they're bigger than me, they're not bigger than us. And if they're bigger than us, then, then we just need more us. We need more staff and more leaders and more volunteers and more givers. But, if, but what if more us is just simply not enough? What if more us will never be enough? What if what we really need is more God? And I think in this last season, these last few years, God just kind of keeps prying my fingers off of more us so that I cling to more God. Are you learning? Are you at a place in your life where you're learning what it's like to cling to the one who will never let you go, the one who upholds you with his right hand, the one who ultimately you don't even have to cling to because he's holding you. My soul is satisfied when I cling. And when I cling, I'm praying. I'm, I'm depending on the one who will never let me go. My soul clings to you, David says. Your right hand upholds me. I'm clinging to the one who will never let me go. And, and, and if you think about it, clinging is really the heart of prayer, isn't it? We're created to worship and we're called to pray. I, I desperately need Christ. I'm thirsty for God. And when our soul thirsts for God, when we get so desperate that all we can do is cling, our thirsting is not just the beginning of prayer. In some ways, I think it is our deepest, truest prayer because desperation drives destination. When we name our thirst, we name our destination. We name what we're aiming towards. We, we need to embrace our hunger and acknowledge that all we can do is cling until God pours out fresh water, until he prepares a feast of his presence. We, we need to own our desperation or we won't make it to his destination. When, when we're no longer willing to settle for less than God, then, then, we'll hear God's invitation to all those who are thirsty, come. More than a, a decade ago, Lynn and I spent about 24 hours with Calvary leaders praying and seeking God's leading for our facilities at, at Harvest Fields, what God wanted us to do with this property that we had been given. And, and you know, I really think that without those 24 hours, I'm, I'm not sure we would be where we are now, a time dedicated to seeking God, not just his wisdom, but his, his presence, his power, his glory, his love. 
That Friday night while we were out at Woodward, um, that's where we gathered, Lynn got a text from Jake. The text was, hey mom, I think I broke my nose playing rugby. She came to me more than a little bit concerned. Dan, Jake thinks he broke his nose playing rug rugby. And of course I said, yeah, but, but who won? <laughs> and she said, I didn't ask. And I, I couldn't understand that. So I texted him. He texted, we won. I played the whole game. I wanted to go home and, and give him a, a, a man hug, a dad hug. But, but at about 1130 at night, Lynn gets a phone call from Sarah. Um, Jake isn't feeling well. He's nauseous. His head hurts. He's groggy. So being a nurse, Lynn knew that he was about to die and she wanted to go see him one last time. So, so we went home to take him to the emergency room and, and he had a broken nose. They, they did a CAT scan of his head, but nothing showed up. I mean, I mean showed up wrong. So mild concussion and, and a broken nose. And, and I'm telling you, with, with that, we could have been in and out of there in no time flat. But at about 1.30 in the morning, the ambulances started coming in, 10 in less than an hour. Each one of them filled with students who had drank too much. Halls were, were full of students on stretchers, unconscious, having their stomachs pumped, some of them. And, and I'm sitting there just waiting in the room and thinking, and just, it hit me that they have a soul thirst that they can't satisfy. They were just thirsty for more. And all the parties and drinking and hooking up and, and whatever else, I mean, it's just, it's just a voice crying out from behind the wall saying, I have a thirst that goes so deep, I'm not sure it will ever be satisfied. And they didn't realize it. They don't realize it. But what they're saying is, I need God so bad. That's actually God's diagnosis. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, he says, For my people have done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. And so Jesus says to all those who are thirsty, come and drink. All those who are thirsty, come and drink. See, God sent Jesus to satisfy the thirst of our souls. Listen to Jesus' words in John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And then again in Revelations 21, it says, He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Do you understand what our souls seek, what our hearts crave, what our minds were made to ponder is Jesus. I mean, there's nothing greater than Christ. Christ is the treasure of Christianity. Listen, I don't know why you're here or why you're even listening to this, but if it's not because of Christ, you're missing everything. I, I love the people at Calvary, but I'm telling you, sooner or later, we'll let you down. You'll leave empty. Don't, don't come because of the people or a program or the music or even the coffee. <laughs> come because of Christ. To every college student in the emergency room, to, to every man or woman sprinting into the destruction of a midlife crisis, to those contemplating an affair or a promotion or winning the lottery or going on some grand adventure. Listen, there is a thirst deep inside you that nothing will touch, nothing will satisfy except Christ. Christ, Christ is more than enough. And I'm not merely saying he can do more than enough. I'm not merely saying that he has more than enough. I'm saying he is in and of himself. He is more than enough. I'm saying that if you have Jesus and nothing else, you have more than enough for life. And the question is, are we willing to stop feeding at banquet tables where the main course is not Christ? If it's necessary, will you let go of the good that you have in order to go after God? Have you noticed the, the hunger pains that come from spending too long away from Jesus? Do you have, and if not, do you want a glorious, gut-wrenching hunger for Christ? I'll be honest, it hurts a little bit to say this, but it also gives me hope because I, I do believe there's a, a solution. <laughs> But I believe that the evangelical church in America is filled with religious people who desperately need an experience of the awesomely, holy, recklessly loving, gloriously amazing Christ. We are created to worship and we're called to pray. So next weekend, 
next week and we're going to spend 36 hours in worship and prayer together at the State Theater from 9 a.m. Saturday morning to 9 p.m. Sunday evening. During the 36 hours, we'll be led in worship by, and prayer by eight different congregations in and, and two-hour slots. In fact, Calvary will be leading from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. on Saturday night and then from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sunday. All those two-hour slots. And I just say, come and go as you're able, but, but don't, don't only go when Calvary is leading. I mean, come when Calvary is leading, but, but not only then. Go as often as you can for as long as you can. We'll, we'll pray for the next generation. We'll pray for a move of God in central PA. We'll, we'll seek the presence of Christ together. Here's what I'm asking. I'm, I'm asking you to give an extraordinary amount of time to worship and prayer next weekend. Let's see how the Spirit of Christ might awaken and satisfy the deepest longings of our souls, for we were created to worship, and we're called to pray. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you that you are the great satisfier of our souls. That the time spent seeking you is never wasted time. There's so many things that we do in our lives, in our world, that are a pure waste of time, but seeking you is never a waste of time. And God, I pray that in the days to come, I pray that especially next weekend, the last weekend of August, God, I pray that on that Saturday and Sunday, there'll be hundreds of people spending an extraordinary amount of time, something more than ordinary, an extraordinary amount of time in worship and prayer because we were created to worship and we're called to pray. And, and when we do it together, there's something gloriously good that can happen. So we, we ask for your presence. We ask that you would pour your spirit out upon us as we gather, as we worship and as we pray. And God, I pray for any person who's experiencing that dryness inside. God, would you awaken their hearts? Would you light a fire to their thirst for you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything just want you I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Jesus, you don't owe me anything.
So are you caught up in the presence of God or are you allowing circumstances of life to tear that relationship down? I'm sure that you probably heard Dan say something like this as he was teaching today. He said, my soul, my soul is satisfied when I cling. When I cling, I am praying to the one who will never let me go. Wow, that is so, so good. So let me ask you, is your soul satisfied? And if it's not, maybe you're lacking some contentment. Know that God so desires to have a relationship with you. He loves you and he will never let you go. It was so great to be with you today. If you have any questions about anything today, or if you want to pray with someone, please just reach out to us. That's all we have for today. We look forward to seeing you next time. I just want to sit here